everyone. Uh, do you hear me? Is the is the line okay? Okay, excellent. And we are heard that or parts of the world, uh, luckily, since you are coming from different parts of the world. So, um, I would like to uh, welcome uh, all the participants and introduce you the chair of the uh, today's uh, afternoon's panel, who will then introduce uh, uh, the panel uh, to you. So, the chair of the panel uh, will be Professor Jody Jensen. She is the director of the Polanyi Center of the Institute of Advanced Studies. And uh, among others, she, she is also associate uh, professor at the University of Pannonia in Hungary and uh, also director of the MA program International Studies. And uh, when talking about uh, research, uh, recent research interest, I just would like to highlight uh, a very interesting book uh, she edited as a uh, 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 actually, it's a landmark of their many years research with the, with the young team from the Balkans, titled Memory Politics uh, and Populism in Southeastern Europe, uh, uh, which was last year published by Routledge. So, um, I think you are the, in the best hands, so <laughs> I pass the... Thank you, Aniko. I see you, Luba. Yeah, I see that you're there. So. Um, there's a little change to the schedule everyone should know about. Um, Andre Kortunov can only join us at 3 o'clock. So um, I was going to start with the other speakers, and then um, maybe if we have time, um, Luba, you can comment and, and, um, on the uh, former yes. speakers. And then after, um, Andre, you can contribute maybe more substantially if, you, if that's Thank all right. You. Okay. Um, Bodan, are you all right in Kiev? Uh, I'm actually closer to Odessa. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm okay. in a rural area. It's not very like important. We don't have any military near here, so yeah. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> just checking in on you. Um, I wanted to just kind of introduce this session by um, mentioning an article that actually Andrei Kortunov wrote for The Economist in May 2020, where he tries to analyze the um, the roots and the kind of the consequences of, of the conflict in between Russia and Ukraine today. And he, he analyzed the situation in this way. He said that the conflict is a clash rather between very different ways of organizing social and political life within two countries that for a long time constituted a large portion of the Soviet territory. Um, and so, as a result, they have, because of these different worldviews, which I'll mention in a minute, um, they have different perceptions of what is right, what is wrong, what is fair, what is not, what is legitimate, and what is illegitimate, and what national leadership should be. Um, in U Ukraine society, he says, is generally organized from the bottom up, while Russian society has a top-down approach at its core. And as an example, he gives, um, since 1991, for example, Ukraine has elected six presidents, and each won power after very highly contested and sometimes very dramatic elections. This doesn't mean that Ukraine is the epitome of what we would call a, a democracy or even a Western democracy, but it is on the road towards that. But in Russia during the same period, um, it has been ruled by only three heads of state, and each new leader was carefully selected and supported by, um, by his predecessor. Um, he emphasizes that the stakes in this conflict could not be any higher, and I think that we're all feeling that today. It's about the future of, it's about our future, the future of the international system, and about the future of the world order. And he outlines three possible scenarios for its conclusion. He said, if the conflict results, um, if the Kremlin loses decisively, we would probably see the emergence of the unipolar moment. 
and I want to ask him about this when he comes on. I mean, the situation of the United States is much different now than it was even in May 2022. So I, I, I wonder what kind of a unipolar world that would mean, especially with China. He said, if the conflict results with an imperfect but mutually acceptable settlement, the final outcome of the collision between Russia and Ukrainian models of development will be postponed. There will be fierce competition between these different worldviews and different ways of organizing society, and that will not, um, that will not emerge till later. He said, if there's no agreement on Ukraine and the conflict endures, with lots of cycles of increased violence, ceasefires, and then violence again. He said the entire international system, institutions may collapse amid an accelerating arms race, which I think we can already see today, increased nuclear proliferation, which if nuclear missiles are going to bellow, Russia right now we see, and the multiplication of regional conflicts. And this would lead only to more chaos in the years ahead. So those are the three scenarios that um, Andre Kortinov um, outlined. It may have changed in the last few months. We can ask him about that. And I would like to introduce our first speaker today, um, Josef Hrabina, who is chief analyst at the Council of Slovak Exporters, where his analysis focus on, focuses on great power rivalries, multipolar international systems, international security, and Russian foreign policy. He's lectured at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, and today he is responsible for studies and strategic analysis of global geopolitical developments. So, Josef, welcome to Kurseg, and thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jody, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to speak on such distinguished panel. Uh, in my today's presentation, I will focus on two uh, to separate issues in a, in a Russia West diet. Uh, first is the, the 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 conflict dynamics in uh, in a post-Soviet space, which I coin to Sidedi's trap in a post-Soviet space. And the second part of my presentation will be uh, will be dedicated to global ramifications of of the of the of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Because the first is, uh, first, the, the, uh, the two-sidedies trap, uh, or what I coin uh, two-sidedies trap in a post-Soviet space, is actually pointing to, to, to Russian reaction to structural shifts. And uh, it is a combination of these, these um, perceptions of what uh, NATO enlargement and, and Western uh, and, and Western uh, spread of uh, the spread of Western values uh, means to Russians, along with the Russian strategic culture that was forming for centuries before, but also in uh, uh, after the, the the collapse of Soviet Union, that uh, really attributed to to what is Russian. Uh, worldview today, or security percep security threat perceptions, uh, too. So, and this all results in a, in Russian zero sum approach to the post Soviet space, uh, or what I called uh, entrapment in in in, a, in in the threat perceptions. Uh, the the global ramifications will be just dedicated to 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 the fact that. Uh, that the U.S. is uh, overstretching from the from the uh, from the Asia Pacific to the Eastern Europe, and there is uh, there is a good uh, reason to think that uh, that that both sides, the U.S. and the Russia, are engaging in Ukraine in order to bleed the open white. Uh, and uh, in case of the U.S., would that mean uh, overextension of power, which is common cause of. Uh, of uh, imperial collapses. So I will start with the two sidedies trap in a post Soviet space. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, there is a famous quote of two sidedies who, who was quoting, uh, was quote, quoting uh, the, the, the major cause of, uh, of a Peloponnesian war, that, so that the, the, the Sparta uh, perceived uh, rise of Athens as a, as a major threat to its, uh, to its uh, to its security, to its position, to its status, which we'll, we'll discuss later, and uh, and thus it decided to 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 attack first before the Athens will become 
too strong to, uh, to contain. Uh, what does it mean when we talk about society is trapped in a post-Soviet space? Uh, first is the structural dynamics. So, so it's a relative decline of uh, Russian influence in a post-Soviet space. Uh, which Russians see uh, see as a, as a as a major major sphere of of its influence that is closely attached to its internal sovereignty, border security, and a great power status. I will start with the with, with the internal so sovereignty uh, here uh, that actually protracts. Uh, there is a timeline uh, how Russian strategic culture was developing after the after the Soviet Union collapsed uh, we seen the first period was uh, based on on, on on fears of internal sovereignty that was a, a period from the the collapse of the Soviet Union to the end of the the, the second Chechen war and what I really uh, what is really important here to, is to understand that that Russia was dealing with the separatist movements from the from the from its very uh, first days of uh, existence. So so there was a separatist uh, tendencies in the Tatarstan. There was there were Chechen wars. And if we have a look at the Russian security doctrine, we will see that since since it's since it since it was established. The, the Russian security community was uh, stating that they that one of their main goals was to prevent external actors to influence its domestic stability. So they blamed, uh, or the Russian security uh, community blames the, the external actors for for interfering in their domestic affairs in order to to prevent to 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 keep Russia weak. Uh, the the and so this is the first pillar of Russian foreign policy or the, the first pillar of Russian national interest to keep internal sovereignty intact or to keep Russia internally intact. Uh, the second is the border security. It's, uh, as you can see, it's for, I stated it's from 2003 when the first revolution in Georgia took place, uh, first pro-Western, really pro-Western revolution in Georgia took place, uh, even though there were uh, anti or pro-Western revolutions in the post-Soviet countries before that. Um, I think the, 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 this one was part of the, the wave of colored so-called colored revolutions that Russia started to perceive as a as an existential threat to its sovereignty. First of all, uh, to its uh, border security, because they wanted to keep uh, as any other great power. They wanted to keep their borders uh, intact and secure, and so so the geopolitical si situation in their border territories should 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 be maintained stable. Uh, that's that's why. They started to 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 openly challenge the notions of uh, colored revolution. We can colored revolutions, and uh, that resulted resulted in in wars such as the Russo-Georgian War in 2008 that actually labeled uh, the labeled the end of uh, Russian aims to integrate into the West. So so shift from Greater Europe to Greater Eurasia. And that, that's, the, the, that's the last point here, uh, the confrontation with the West, because Russia started to, started to perceive, perceive the, the, the structural dynamics in a post-Soviet space as a zero-sum game. So either or, kto kavo, in, in Russian. Uh, we see the, the last point here is the great power status, which is very important for Russia. Uh, Russian strategic culture uh, or Russian strategic perception see uh, great power status as uh, as uh, something that is really required in order to 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 secure the former two uh, pillars of uh, for uh, international secure or security threat perception so internal security and border security uh, can be maintained only when the Russia will be a great power because it can ha it can build autonomous foreign policy it can have or it has its own sphere of influence which is the near abroad or the post soviet space uh, and and also it actually uh, it actually is equal amongst the strongest uh, which was actually one of the most important issues when it 
when it boils down to to Russia, Russia West Rift, because Russia didn't want it to be a, a, a second tier partner or junior partner to the U.S., but they really wanted to become uh, equal amongst the strongest. And and as we know from the theory of international relations and from the history, unipolar structures are hierarchical one. Not that it is not a flat hierarchy. The flat hierarchy is multipolarity. That's why China and Russia today very um, uh, inc very strongly uh, assert the notions of multipolar system or, po or polycentric world that is known in Russian uh, Russian uh, discourse. So, so we see that that over the time, as the Russian national interest, uh, uh, national interest evolved in the post uh, in, in in its own strategic culture, the threat perception rose, and this is this is why it is important to understand Russian motives or Russian threat perceptions, because in the Ukraine they really felt that. All three of the pillars were under uh, were, were threatening to to Russia. Also, the expansion of NATO is uh, is kind of uh, appealing to this uh, threat perception in Russia. That's why Russia invaded Ukraine, and and uh, and the outcome is, or the, the the follow up of this is that Russia will do it anytime it's uh, in in post of its base when. The NATO will, would somehow uh, increase its influence because Russians see that as a as a zero sum. So either we are here to to it, it is our sphere of influence or yours, and and we will fight for that because it is a vital interest to keep our own sphere influence in a post-Soviet space. Uh, now um, I will head to global ramifications and what uh, what I think it's uh, the major issue when it comes down to to, to great power uh, competition in 21st century, and it is the the the, the looming over extension of power because uh, the U.S. Uh, was in 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 deep re not not deep it was actually the the. It, it wasn't as deep retrenchment as, as it could be, but the U.S. was retrenching since, even I could say, I would say since uh, to, uh, first Obama administration, because uh, there was the big restart in uh, Russian-American relations. Uh, so the U.S. was uh, aware, uh, the, America was aware of, uh, of uh, being too stretched over the entire world. That's why they wanted to end, uh, wanted to end the wars in the Middle East and uh, reconcile with Russia. That didn't work well. Uh, though today we can say uh, the the U.S. has retreated from from the Middle East partly, and they were planning to retreat from the from the Europe. They were certainly planning to to get engaged with uh, open confrontation or even a proxy war over Ukraine with Russia whilst they were in the midst of what they call since 2016 pivot to Asia. So the major major challenger to the US was actually China and is still China because it is a country of size of continent that can actually take over the US leading position in the world. And what this uh, overextension of power logic says is that you know you you cannot fight two opponents at the same time, or you cannot contain two opponents at the same time. You need to pay attention to only one issue at the time. And what is USA actually doing now is that they're, they're containing China and they're fighting Russia in, in Eastern, Eastern Ukraine, not literally, but you know, they're helping Ukraine, supplying it, and they're, they're paying significant attention to the issue. Uh, this logic can be, uh, at, uh, kind of uh, applied to, to Russian actions in Ukraine because they could, and it's just, a, it's just a theory, that they could agree with China that they will keep the US overstretched because they know what happens when the great power keeps uh, keep too many uh, commit, uh, keep, uh, keeps being engaged in too many uh, commitments at the same time. And uh, since both are sort of pariahs now, 
uh, of the of the international affairs, uh, they would uh, they they would uh, much more prefer the uh, dec relative decline in the U.S. influence and a flat hierarchy in terms of multipolar system. What we actually saw when they signed their uh, treaty just weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, they signed a treaty that confirmed the uh, multipolar vision of the world. So, uh, so uh, this, is, this is pretty much all about, uh, about the, the uh, the global ramification. In conclusion, we will see uh, intensifying great power competition in post-Soviet space, as we don't see any uh, any 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 uh, peace uh, peace oriented efforts on both sides. Uh, we even see uh, deteriorating in, uh, relations with Lithuania over Suvalki corridor. We might see uh, similar actions in Georgia once the war in Ukraine is over, if ever. Uh, and uh, and let's see what what can happen about Moldova. Uh, what will be what will be another another consequence of this uh, is reinforced global redistribution of power. To make things clear, uh, the the it, the redistribution of power or, or shifts in a global status quo. So the U.S wasn't that, that we were shifting from the from the from the hegemony to non-polarity or multipolarity or bipolarity we can discuss that um, uh, they, these shifts were already uh, in motion for several years now this uh, actions will only these actions f firstly only shows how deep the uh, the state, how much the status quo has shifted over the past few years, because uh, India refused to 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 side with the West, uh, OPEC allies refused to 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 increase the the production of oil, and with that, uh, they are causing troubles uh, America uh, to America at their domestic front. We'll see how how the the, the upcoming uh, visit of uh, of Biden in Saudi Arabia will uh, will will work out these uh, work on these issues. And we'll see. Uh, we, we see that the that the West is suffering from the economic crisis now, and we will witness multipolarization of uh, economic affairs because uh, we we see the redistribution of materials. We we, we see we, we're discussing how to how to how to reorganize our supply chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So so the global economy will become more regionalized along with the political affairs. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think I, I took a little too long, so I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much, Josef. I knew you would <laughs> give us a good introduction, a good overview. Um, can I see the list of uh, participants? Yelena Yurishic, I saw you there before. Uh, are you here? I'm here. There you are, good. Good. Well, welcome. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I call on you as the next speaker. We're kind of out of order here today. Um, just a heads up to Marco Puleri, who will be, come after you. Anyway, uh, welcome to KUSEG, virtually, Yelena. Um, I would like to introduce you to the group. Uh, Yelena Yurisic is the head of the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Zagreb. She received her PhD in philology, specializing in journalism, at the Moscow State University. Her journalistic career encompasses her expertise on Russia and other post-Soviet countries. Her activities include media consumption and impact on families, digital literacy, social media impact on journalism, media trust, and the media coverage of current challenges like migration. So, Yelena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, well, this is not the first time in history that politicians have talked about creating a new world order. Probably it's not the last. The new world order was first used by US President Woodrow Wilson during the formation of the League of Nations, speaking up about the world after the First World War. He called it the center of the new international order, but it didn't justify that role. Next was uh, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill talking after Second World War in Zurich about the new world. 
This time built around the United Nations and the renewed Europe with the help of the United States, UK and USSR. Two years later, that same Europe and with it the whole world was divided by his Iron Curtain. The world then entered the Cold War period in which international law and international agreements were mostly respected and the UN played a key role in maintaining peace despite the block tensions in the logical intolerance and the arms race. Some analysts today believe that uh, just then, unlike today, uh, the world order existed and functioned. After the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, politicians began to talk about a new world order. First, Mikhail Gorbachev from the beginning of 1989 and then George Bush. The Soviet leader initially understood the term as nuclear disarmament and security agreements and later expanded to strengthen the UN expand cooperation from north to south and uh, solve economic and security problems in the world. Before the historic summit in Malta, President Bush included in that uh, in it the unification, the unification of Germany, respect from human rights and polarity in the international system. The Gulf crisis shifted the meaning of the term to the cooperation of superpowers and the, uh, and the regional crisis, the economy, the problems of North, North and South, and uh, the integration of the USSR into the international system and changes in economic and military polarity. It seems uh, that, that uh, yesterday's enemy had left the hostility behind and together set out to build a new united and equal world. But after the international coalition's victory in the Gulf War, Bush declared in a speech to Congress on September 11, 1991, the new US-led world order, free from the threat of terrorism, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and safer in the pursuit of peace. On that day, 10 years later, as we know, Al-Qaeda carried out several terroristic attacks on the United States. But uh, that American-led world order deviated from the path relatively quickly, especially from international law, which was formally still it, its basis. Thus, in 1999, the US-led NATO intervened against uh, Sloboda Milosevic's Yugoslavia without a UN mandate. Four years later, US Secretary of State Colin Powell tried to get it by lying about the existence of secret labs and chemical weapons in Iraq, showing a test tube with evidence which actually contained detergent. Uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, with the help of several coalition partners, invaded Iraq six weeks later, overthrowing and killing Saddam Hussein, but found no chemical or other weapons of mass destruction. An even larger coalition was formed in 2011 to intervene in Libya and overthrow Amar Gaddafi. Two years later, it was the turn of Syria and Bashar al-Assad, but Russia prevented the new intervention with a plan to destroy chemical weapons. It happened a year later, again without a UN mandate, but the targets of airstrikes were the position of ISIL and al-Nusra and other terrorist organizations, while opponents of the government were supported on the ground. This brief overview of military interventions <coughs> was how the US-led world order actually created the disorder. It has happened in other cells as well, especially in the United States. second. Action of his disagreement. At the moment, it seems distance of bricks in a
ब्रिक्स को ब्रिक्स प्लस समिट इन विच इन अडिशन टू ब्राजील रशिया इंडिया चाइना एंड साउथ अफ्रीका फोर्टीन अदर कंट्रीज इट वॉज जी ट्वेंटी मेंबर्स माइनस जी सेवन मेंबर्स पार्टिसिपेटेड इट वॉज अ ग्रेट दैट एसोसिएशन वुड एक्सपेंड सऊदी अरेबिया अर्जेंटीना मेक्सिको एंड इवन टर्की आई मैंशन एज अ पॉसिबल फर्स्ट न्यू मेंबर्स Well, that is for from me for now. Thank you. Now you gave us a very good historical perspective on uh, recent developments, and and quite broadly. So I think we need to get back to that uh, U.S. New World Order uh, that has become disorder, because in many ways we're seeing the demise of democracy in the U.S. at the same time as we're seeing this uh, this conflict. Uh, developing in in Ukraine. Um the next guest I would like to introduce to you is Marco Puleri. Uh, there you are. I see you. Um Marco Puleri is a senior assistant professor at the University of Bologna. His research includes contemporary Russian and Ukrainian socio-cultural developments and nation building in the post-Soviet era. His latest book deals with hybrid identities and narratives in post-Soviet culture and politics. He's worked on many international research projects on Russia and China and multiculturalism and regional regionalism in post-Maidan Ukraine and developing new curriculum on global migration, diaspora and border studies in East Central Europe and probably most importantly you are a research fellow here at IASC some years ago. So welcome back Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot Jody for your Fantastic introduction. I would say I'm very glad to be here with you. Actually, yes. I had the pleasure to be uh, an IS fellow in, in, pre in pre pandemic times. So I had also the pleasure to meet you all in person. And I hope that this will happen soon again. And uh, today, actually, I would like also to thank you for inviting me to join this discussion around. The impact and results of Russia's military aggression in Ukraine on the so-called global order. Uh, actually, that's undoubted. I guess that uh, this event has overturned, in a sense, our understandings of the dynamics of international relations in the global arena. Uh, but in my view, we still deserve, and uh, I guess that this has come out also from the previous uh, talks. A broader reflection on the long-term dynamics of political and social developments in what we were used to call the post-Soviet space, where this change has been mirrored, I would say, more prominently. Uh, thus, today in my talk, I would like to share some general reflections on the dynamics of change which have affected the post-Soviet region, looking at the shaping of the political imagery uh, built around the former Soviet area in the last 30 years, by both external observers and primarily scholars on the one end and domestic political actors on the other. Uh, we will thus look at the interactive evolution of internal and external definitions of the post-Soviet space, uh, revealing a broader process of diversification of political developments, as uh, it has been mentioned also previously by other, by other speakers in the last decades. I will thus aim mainly to reflect on the one end on the evolution of our external observation of the dynamics of change in the region, and at the same time, at the way the same political and cultural actors from the area have shaped their own understanding of their position in the global field of international relations after the fall of the USSR. Uh, I would now try to share my screen. Um, let's see if it will actually If you can see my screen, I hope so. Yes. Here we are. Uh, the title of my talk uh, is uh, quite, I would say, enigmatic and ambiguous. This remapping the post-Soviet space and recalls the title and the discussions coming from, from a course that they actually held last year for students at the University of Bologna. And uh, uh, this title is actually, and this speech is actually meant as a critical, I would say, self-reflection on our role as an academic community, as scholars in area studies, 
to adopt and find the right tools and terms in order to grasp the diversification of dynamics in the region. A self-reflection in my view that has of course been made more and more relevant and needed in the aftermath of the dramatic developments starting last February. So, uh, as I briefly mentioned in my introduction during the, the, the 30 years since the collapse of the USSR, political and social scientists have questioned the possibility of defining a new interpretive paradigm for the study of the cultural and political dynamics of the area commonly defined through the post-Soviet descriptor that was mainly meant as a temporal category. Uh, in an attempt to address pressing issues concerning contemporary developments, new research questions arose in both political and scholarly debates. First of all, what are the common social, cultural and political features shared by the states making up the space of the former Soviet Union today? Can we still talk about the post-Soviet space as a whole? And eventually, is post-Soviet still a useful category in order to understand the developments within the region? Uh, actually, these were some of the questions that have not arisen only after Russia's aggression, but have been already posed for several years and even five years ago, um, uh, that is uh, 25 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, by a collective of scholars re-examining the content of the Soviet dynamics for the Canon Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. And these are questions that are undoubtedly, I would say, relevant today. The very ambiguity, I would say, of the term post-Soviet as a geographical category, which includes countries with very different social and political systems and invested by profound changes and transformations in recent years, has created a true interpretive vacuum for the study of the region. And I guess that's something that has emerged quite prominently even after the, the start of the Russia's aggression in Ukraine in our attempts to understand what was happening in between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, on the one of as an inclusive and plural category, which indeed includes a common historical heritage and common challenges, but at the same time considers different responses and outcomes. On the other hand, scholars of the area have gradually preferred to use different terminologies and categories to discuss developments in the region in broader conceptual and geographical terms. Let's just think about what is happening in these days in media or in scholarly debates uh, with talks emerging about the new neo-imperialism or post-colonialism of the post-Soviet region, or these speeches and categories have been limited to regional and local dynamics, we could say, such as the Baltics, the Eastern Slavs, Caucasus or Central Asia. And moving now to the different mappings of the former Soviet I mean, what I mean as the main point we should uh, always highlight while looking at what is happening now, that is the diversification of the so-called post-Soviet transition that took shape all along the last 30 years. And the different experiences of the 15 newly born states after the collapse of the Soviet Union that uh, you can see here depicted in green. Uh, as we see as a geographic term, uh, the term post-Soviet is rather ambiguous as it includes a diverse array of political experiences. For example, the Baltic states became full members of the European Union in 2004, while more recently Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia and Armenia joined the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union. And here you see in dark blue the member state of the Eurasian Economic Union, in light blue the third state having a free trade agreement with the Union, and in yellow those serving as observers. These diversified dyna dynamics are best reflected by the developments of the, in the post-Soviet states, which emerged in between, we could say, the, what are usually defined as the two centers of influence, and we could maybe better name as the competing regional integration processes emerging in between Europe and Russia. That is, on the one hand, the uh, so-called uh, Eastern European partnership that includes Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and uh, Ukraine and Armenia, uh, that are all members of this platform since 2009. Furthermore, usually we, we, are assume, we assume to look at what uh, has recently happened in, the, in East Ukraine, in Donetsk and Lugansk region as being something quite, quite extraordinary for, for the post-Soviet region. But actually, and this is also another, we could say, a misunderstanding of what have been the developments within the region, 
if we just consider and we have a look at this map depicting what uh, are usually described as the, as the so-called gray areas in post-Soviet, we may say Europe, or what are described as the so-called de facto states or frozen conflicts uh, in the region that, that uh, still trace back not only to the conflicts emerging in between the West and Russia, but still uh, push us to go back to the dynamics of the collapse of the Soviet Union itself, or even before to the dynamics of Pierestroika, if we just think at what happened in, in Nagorno-Karabakh or most of these uh, regions, when the start of the democratization process uh, under uh, Gorbachev, uh, Gorbachev's Pierestroika uh, took shape. And so here in this map, we can have a look at going uh, from uh, the west to the east, to the case of uh, uh, Transnistria, uh, the, uh, of course, the peninsula uh, of Crimea, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic that have been the, uh, the last, the, the most recent, we could say, uh, um, de facto states emerging within the region, but also, of course, to the cases of, of Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Nagorno-Karabakh in the South Caucasus. So this means that in our understanding of what the post-Soviet region is, we should assume that we are not talking only about 15 newly independent states, but also, also about six unrecognized de facto states. And so this already conveys a new understanding of a region where actually a so-called post-Soviet political order has, uh, has, the, has, uh, has emerged with great difficulty, difficulties, even uh, at the times of its own emergence. And this, of course, uh, can let us understand how the different practices, for example, implemented by the Russian political elite in recent years are not something new as for um, potential, we could say, policies implemented as for dealing with these conflicts. We, are, we can just think about the so-called passportization policies that are frequently mentioned uh, in, in media and in scholarly debates uh, as for the so-called uh, Russification of the regions under the control of Russia. Actually, this is a policy that uh, even goes uh, back to times preceding the war in Georgia itself. If we just think about the policies implemented by the Russian political elite uh, during the first presidential mandate of President Putin in 2002, 2004, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, where in few months, actually, more than thousand, more than hundred thousands of passport, Russian passports has been, have been a given to population within the region. So we see that actually we are mainly talking about a long-term process that has come to a phase of high contestation uh, since most of the uh, policies implemented by the Russian Federation in order to recreate a new political order under its own, under its own uh, we would say, edges or hegemony have come not to the expected results by the uh, Russian political elites. And here we can maybe go to this, uh, uh, we could say, any integration processes promoted mostly by uh, the Russian Federation that actually have never come to uh, gather together or to include all the actors emerged from the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. If we just think that none of these platforms that did emerge after the collapse of the Soviet Union have been successful in gathering together all the 15 uh, post-Soviet states emerged after the collapse of the Union itself. And this, of course, caused from time to time, we could say uh, um, the emergence of a more assertive stance of Russian political elites in order to uh, try to make this process more and more effective. And I guess this is something we should take into account while considering the actual dynamics within the region and the Russian position within the region itself. Uh, trying to go uh, further and just briefly, because I, I would not like to take too much time from, uh, from the uh, broader discussion with all of you, uh, we can also find some uh, some uh, uh, points uh, emerging from the scholarly debate about what we can describe as the so-called unexpected outcomes of the so-called post-Soviet transition, especially in the Russian Federation, that go back not, not only to the, uh, we could say, more recent times, and so to the times of the uh, third and fourth presidential mandate of President Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, but still also to the uh, to the emergence itself of Putin's, uh, we could say, 
uh, political um, political regime in Russia in the early 2000s. And here I would like to bring to your attention the so-called deconstruction of the transition paradigm brought to the center stage also by some of the most prominent, we could say, uh, scholarly uh, observers uh, of the region, such as Peter Rutland, that still in 2003 uh, could look at the uh, developments in Russia as actually disappointing the expectations what could be described as the expectations of the Western uh, uh, observers in the so-called democratization process within the region. And here, I would say that all the questions that you can find in these slides about what, about what the uh, Russian, Russian destiny could be actually are very uh, actual and topical, even nowadays while thinking about uh, what, how the Russian, how the Russian political system has been shaped in, in, in recent decades. Um, uh, actually, the uh, so-called end mentioned by, uh, by politologists or uh, political actors even uh, within uh, the uh, Russian Federation in the aftermath of the Russia's aggression in Ukraine. And here I invite you to read also the latest publication in Rasiyab Globalnei Politike by Fyodor Lukyanov, or uh, some of the prominent, we could say, uh, intellectuals close to the Kremlin that are trying to describe uh, the, uh, the uh, potential developments in the future of what is happening nowadays vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the West. We are, you, we are frequently, we could say, listening to this proclaimed end of the post-Soviet era. And actually, there's something that, uh, in order to uh, understand it, I, I would say also this kind of rhetoric or this kind also of vision or view of international relations within the region, I would say that we should come back to an, an important uh, game changer that has been already mentioned by some of the other uh, speakers, uh, such as the uh, war in Georgia in 2008, that actually has been also, uh, has been also mentioned by uh, Dmitry Medvedev himself, uh, that 21st of February, when the uh, meeting of the, of the Security Council of the Russian Federation met in order to take a decision on the recognition of the sovereignty of the uh, so-called uh, People's Republic in Donetsk and Lugansk, as being also a, a, an important, we could say, a signal for the uh, Russian elite in order to understand the, the new way to shape their own relation with the West. Actually, Dmitry Medvedev was being, being asked uh, to, uh, to give his own opinion on the potential recognition of Donetsk and Lugansk. People's Republic stated that uh, actually what happened in 2008 when the uh, Russian Federation took this decision, actually in August, uh, recognizing Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, didn't bring before uh, to a deterioration of relations with the West, since it was possible to restore those relations in the aftermath of this quite tense position. And I guess that this statement by Dmitry Medvedev can give us an understanding of the way the conflict in 2008 with Georgia has also reshaped the dynamics within the post-Soviet region itself and also the perception of the Russian elite uh, with the about the potential, we could say, reactions of Western actors vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Russian Federation itself. And this is something that has also been uh, quite frequently um, mentioned also by scholarly observers, and here I bring to your attention the uh, some uh, quotes from a quite uh, uh, interesting article published by uh, Kevin Platt, that is uh, and uh, that that in an article published in 2008 uh, entitled "Is the post soviet over?" actually was was it actually questioning the uh, possibility of a discontinuity between the uh, older Soviet, we could say, rhetoric and perception of the former region of the so-called historic Russia, as it has been described by Putin himself in his speech on the 21st of February, and the uh, dynamics, we could say, of the post-Soviet debate uh, following the war in Georgia in 2008. And in order to uh, conclude, I would say, uh, and maybe I could uh, then share some other reflections so together with you, uh, in the in the broader debate, I guess that what is interesting to notice is that another turning point in these uh, developments should be identified, in my view, also in the protest movement that did emerge in the Russian Federation in 2011-12, uh, 
that was actually a protest movement that had a quite large uh, potential for change uh, within Russia itself and preceded the so, uh, we would say, hated um, Maidan revolution uh, in uh, Ukraine or the uh, Revolutia Gidnasty in, uh, in Ukrainian. Uh, or the revolution of dignity, as it is uh, named by Ukrainians uh, themselves, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, this protest movement has actually been followed by the real election of Putin in 2012. And as we can see in one of the uh, of the um, uh, we could say electoral documents published by President Putin himself in 2012, preceding his re-election to power, it was the same president of the Russian Federation to proclaim the end of the post-Soviet era. And I guess this um, um, rhetoric around the uh, potential end of the post-Soviet era as a era, we could say, of uh, westernization of the, uh, of the uh, political systems in the, uh, the uh, post-Soviet region or democratization implemented in Western terms and following the Western norms in the region is uh, the main uh, bone of contention, we could say, uh, that we are dealing with while uh, looking at what is happening nowadays in Ukraine. And I guess that the proclaimed end of the post-Soviet era has a quite important meaning, not only for Russia, but also for the broader region, uh, as we can uh, see that, uh, um, that the, uh, the, the potential, we could say, of this uh, proclamation actually could have uh, uh, an impact also on the mutual recognition of political borders and post-Soviet uh, political systems uh, between the different actors uh, that are involved in, in this debate. I would, uh, I would maybe stop here since I guess that maybe I went too far uh, and I thank you for your attention. Marco, there was a very interesting new contribution to the speeches that we had previously. Um, good afternoon, Andrei Kortonov. Thank you very much for being with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, and I'm uh, sorry if I interrupted Lubov Shishelina. I uh, do not consider myself to be <laughs> more... ...exceeds mine uh, in a very broad... We're, we're just very grateful to have both of you with us today. So let me give, <laughs> thank, thank. <laughs> let me give an introduction to the audience um, about who you are. Uh, Andrei Kurtunov is the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. His extensive international experience includes internships at Soviet embassies in London and Washington and the permanent delegation of the USSR to the UN. He taught at universities around the world, including at the University of California, Berkeley, where I was also, uh, I think maybe at the same time, in the Berkeley Stanford program in Soviet studies, if you recall. Um, besides his director's, <laughs> directorship at REAC, he is an expert member of many Russian and international organizations. His academic interests include contemporary international relations and Russian foreign policy. I think many of us have seen you lately on CNN and other uh, media platforms, um, Andre. I actually began this session with a reference to your article in The Economist um, in, from May 2022 about your three scenarios for what may happen in Ukraine. Um, of course, we want to hear everything you might have to say on, on the state of affairs today, and maybe you might want to address how those three scenarios are looking um, now from the perspective of several months later, and also with events in the U.S. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be a part uh, of, this, uh, of this event. Uh, let me say that uh, I think it's important that uh, we're able to continue uh, a dialogue uh, which uh, includes uh, uh, both uh, European and Russian scholars. Uh, we might disagree on certain issues, uh, though I would venture to say that uh, the uh, borderlines uh, between uh, various modes of thinking now cut across uh, national boundaries and political parties. Uh, my intention was uh, to share with you some of my thoughts uh, about the repercussions uh, of the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict uh, on the system of international relations. Uh, and uh, it's a big subject, uh, so I'll try to condense it uh, 
as I understand, I have about uh, half an hour uh, to express my views on that. Uh, let me start with saying that uh, a lot has already been said, a lot has already been written about uh, the consequences uh, of this crisis uh, for uh, the global economy and uh, for the global security. Uh, it's uh, easy to conclude uh, that uh, uh, the uh, main victims uh, economically uh, will be the countries directly involved in this conflict, uh, that is uh, Ukraine and the Russian Federation. Uh, most of the forecasts suggest that uh, the Ukrainian GNP uh, is likely to go down by approximately 45, maybe even 50 percent this year. Uh, it's really a very serious blow to the national economy, uh, to the social fabric uh, and uh, to institutions of the country. Uh, Russia will uh, uh, suffer as well, probably not as much as Ukraine, but uh, its GNP is also likely to go down uh, by at least uh, uh, 11, 12 percent, but maybe more than that. Uh, if we see further, it's also clear that uh, the international implications of the conflict will not be limited uh, to two countries directly participated participated uh, in the conflict. Uh, if you look at the most recent uh, forecasts uh, by the International Monetary Fund and uh, by the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, you'll see that uh, they uh, uh, introduce uh, corrections, adjustments to their uh, previous forecasts. Uh, the economic growth uh, uh, in uh, the world uh, will slow down uh, by approximately 1% uh, this year and uh, maybe 0.8% uh, within next year. Uh, the global inflation will be higher, both uh, in the developed world and within emerging economies. Uh, some of these inflation rates uh, are, are reaching uh, uh, peaks uh, in this century. Uh, we can talk about 7-8% for most of uh, uh, European countries. Uh, we can uh, talk about uh, 8, 9 or even 10% uh, for the developing countries. Uh, so inflation will definitely be one of the prices to be paid uh, for this uh, conflict. Uh, likewise, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, very significant and uh, arguably long-term implications uh, for uh, global and uh, regional security. Uh, the crisis uh, in Ukraine will have indirect impact on the situation in the Middle East region. Uh, it might complicate, uh, and uh, I would even say it is already complicating the situation in Syria uh, and uh, uh, in uh, the Sahel uh, zone of Africa. Uh, we might see further deterioration of the security situation in uh, the Southeast Asia and uh, across uh, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, definitely, uh, this uh, crisis uh, might accelerate nuclear proliferation as well as proliferation of other weapons of uh, mass uh, destruction. Uh, uh, however, having said that, uh, I think that academically uh, we should uh, make uh, two footnotes uh, to this uh, very general assessment uh, of the implications of the Ukrainian conflict uh, for the global economy and the global security system. Uh, the first footnote is that uh, uh, basically what we see right now in the international relations uh, is like a perfect storm. Uh, we have uh, uh, many negative trends uh, overlapping with each other. So the uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine is important, uh, but uh, it is not the only trend which we should uh, keep an eye on. Uh, if uh, we look at other uh, negative developments over the last couple of years, uh, let me mention the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, which has not been fully overcome. And uh, we might still uh, have a new outburst of the pandemic this year or maybe next year. Uh, we've seen uh, a very difficult and very precarious uh, process of energy transition, which uh, contributed to the uh, volatility 
uh, of the energy prices. So we can say that uh, the crisis uh, in Ukraine is partially responsible for the uh, peaks of energy prices in Europe, but it is not the only reason. There are some other reasons as well. And the same might be applied uh, to the current uh, food crisis. Uh, definitely, the conflict contributed a lot uh, to the rise of uh, global food prices, especially on wheat, but also on some other basic food stock. Uh, but uh, this crisis was simmering uh, for at least uh, two or three years. And of course, uh, it has uh, deeper roots uh, than just a conflict uh, in Europe. Although, if you take away uh, 20 million of uh, tons of Ukrainian wheat from the market, definitely it will have implications uh, for uh, the global food prices. And uh, it is something that apparently triggered restrictive measures uh, introduced by other major exporters of wheat uh, and other food stock. Uh, so uh, we should keep in mind uh, that uh, definitely the crisis of uh, 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 in Ukraine uh, was uh, in a way complemented uh, and uh, exacerbated uh, by other problems that we've seen emerging in the world over the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, my second uh, footnote uh, to this very general statement uh, is that uh, the crisis is not over. Uh, we do not know uh, how this uh, conflict ends. Uh, we don't know when it ends. Uh, we don't know how the uh, peaceful settlement might look like and whether we even have a peaceful settlement uh, because uh, the conflict might become a frozen conflict uh, with no political agreement uh, emerging anytime soon. Uh, so a lot will depend uh, on the situation on the battlefield and uh, I think that, uh, unfortunately, right now, uh, both sides apparently believe uh, that uh, their positions might uh, get stronger over time. Uh, Russia clearly counts uh, on its military superiority and uh, it continues to advance in Donbass, uh, maybe slower than uh, it uh, uh, has initially anticipated, but still the Russian offensive uh, goes on, uh, the losses of on the Ukrainian side are growing, uh, but uh, Ukraine counts uh, on the increase uh, in the Western military assistance. Uh, it counts uh, on mobilization. Uh, and if you talk to Ukrainians, they would suggest that uh, the course of the conflict uh, might change quite dramatically closer to the end of summer or maybe in order fall. Uh, and Ukrainians will start regaining some of the territories that um, they have lost uh, in the beginning of this conflict. Uh, so there is unfortunately no appetite uh, for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we are not uh, getting any closer to a peaceful agreement. At least I don't see it uh, looming on the horizon. This is very unfortunate. Uh, I think uh, it is detrimental to the interests of uh, both sides. It is detrimental to European security. Uh, but it seems that we have to go through yet another cycle of escalation before uh, we can count uh, on some uh, activities on the diplomatic track. I would be happy to be mistaken, uh, but my contacts uh, uh, in Moscow and in Kyiv suggest that uh, we are not yet at this juncture. Uh, so you referred uh, to my uh, small piece in The Economist and indeed uh, I laid out uh, three uh, possible scenarios. Uh, for the uh, uh, for the international uh, relations uh, evolution for the future of the uh, global uh, uh, order uh, in view of the current developments uh, in Ukraine and other factors that uh, affect the uh, transition uh, in the international system. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, these uh, three scenarios can be labeled as uh, restoration, reformation, and uh, revolution. And let me use uh, uh, another 10 or 12 minutes of your time to outline each of these scenarios and uh, what they will mean for all of us. Uh, let me start uh, with the uh, restoration. Uh, this uh, scenario uh, is based on the assumption uh, that uh, in the end of the day, the West will prevail 
the West and Ukraine will prevail in the current uh, conflict. Uh, Russia will have uh, to step back without uh, having achieved uh, its military and political uh, goals that it uh, sets for itself in the beginning of the uh, military operation. Uh, Russia will uh, fail uh, to maintain its territorial gains uh, because of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, it will fail uh, to prevent Ukraine from building strong relationship uh, with the North Atlantic Alliance. Uh, and uh, it will fail to get any kind of even a de facto recognition of the changed legal status uh, of Crimea and uh, Donbass. Uh, the Western uh, military assistance to Ukraine will continue. There'll be no Ukrainian fatigue uh, in the West. Uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine uh, will emerge as victorious, uh, though probably some of the problems between Ukraine and Russia will not be re uh, resolved at this particular juncture. Uh, if it happens, it will give a major boost uh, to the integrity of the West. And we could uh, talk about the Western uh, consolidation, at least for next couple of years. The consolidation will uh, go beyond the Ukrainian crisis. It will include uh, a more coordination uh, among Western countries on uh, major foreign policy issues uh, related not only to Russia, but also to China and uh, to some other very important uh, international issues. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, China will have uh, to step back on some of its uh, demands. Uh, it will uh, uh, stop intimidating uh, Taiwan. Uh, it will have to make a new trade agreement with the United States and uh, with the European Union. And uh, it will have to play by the rules, uh, the rules which are set uh, uh, by the West. Uh, this uh, scenario also uh, implies uh, that uh, uh, the Western consolidation would uh, extend uh, to what we call uh, global commons. The West will have a united position on such issues as uh, climate change, uh, like uh, resolving the uh, food crisis, uh, uh, rendering economic assistance uh, to the third world, uh, and essentially, uh, the West will set the rules uh, for the new international system, uh, at least in the foreseeable future. Uh, it would imply uh, that uh, multilateralism will uh, uh, flourish uh, in this world. Uh, international institutions uh, will keep going. Russia will continue to be isolated in the international system for an extended period of time. Uh, it will have uh, to pay a very heavy price. Uh, for the conflict, uh, financial price and also political price. Uh, and uh, uh, this scenario implies that essentially we are getting back to where we were some 25 or 30 years ago at the end of the uh, Cold War uh, with the Western triumphalism uh, and uh, the concepts of the end of history. Uh, and uh, the unipolar world, of course, adjusted uh, to meet uh, the current uh, uh, environment. So that's the first scenario. The second scenario is uh, what I would call reformation. And this scenario implies that uh, in the end of the day, uh, some political compromise uh, uh, in the Ukrainian conflict has to be reached. And uh, we can say a lot about uh, the specific modalities of such a compromise, what it might involve, uh, how the two sides uh, will have to <clears throat> drop some of their maximalist uh, demands. Uh, I think that uh, this scenario involves a neutral status for Ukraine with some security guarantees that will be rendered to Kyiv uh, by major international players. Uh, it will also mean uh, that uh, Russia will have uh, to withdraw uh, from some of the territories uh, that uh, it now occupies in Ukraine, including uh, first and foremost the Ukrainian South. Uh, sanctions uh, will continue, uh, but uh, uh, this scenario implies that in the end of the day, the West will have to reach some uh, compromises and some adjustments with uh, the rest. 
uh, first and foremost uh, with China. Uh, the United States will have to make certain concessions in terms of trade, uh, maybe in terms of competition in uh, modern technologies. Uh, the Western alliance uh, will remain, but uh, uh, it uh, uh, will uh, not prevent uh, serious disagreements uh, between the United States uh, and uh, the European Union on, on trade issues, uh, on uh, climate change, on some issues related uh, to the global south. Uh, the reformation scenario implies uh, uh, certain efforts uh, to reform the United Nations and uh, major international institutions uh, like uh, the World Bank, IMF, uh, WTO, uh, and uh, uh, many uh, others. So uh, this scenario is uh, based on the idea that uh, uh, there'll be uh, some kind of a transition period uh, to uh, a new uh, world order. Uh, Russia will stay semi-isolated, uh, but in the end of the day, uh, it will be reintegrated into the uh, global system. It will take time and effort, but uh, this is the direction in which the world will go. And finally, uh, revolution. Uh, revolution implies uh, that uh, no peace agreement in Ukraine is reached, that uh, we will see just very shaky uh, truce, uh, some de-escalation of the military activities, but this de-escalation will be used by the two sides uh, to regroup, to resupply. Uh, and uh, to prepare uh, for a new cycle of escalation. Uh, so the situation in Ukraine will continue to be very bad uh, for everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, no attempts or no, uh, at, no successful attempts uh, at uh, uh, reaching a global consensus on the rules of the game uh, is going to uh, work out. Uh, which uh, implies that uh, we are going to see a growing fragmentation of the international system. Uh, we will see uh, enhanced arms race uh, involving uh, major players in Europe, uh, in Asia, and in Middle East. We are likely to see a proliferation of nuclear weapons and uh, other weapons of mass destruction. Uh, again, uh, no GCPOA, no major agreements uh, to contain nuclear ambitions of uh, North Korea, no attempt to work jointly on uh, global commons. Uh, we are likely uh, to see more nationalism, more protectionism, protectionism uh, uh, on, uh, on the part of uh, major global economies. Uh, this revolution scenario means that uh, we will see more conflicts uh, uh, in uh, various parts of the world, uh, again, including Middle East and uh, Southeast Asia, and maybe even Latin America, uh, we will see more nationalism and uh, gradual demise of uh, international institutions, including uh, the United Nations, uh, including uh, international financial and uh, economic institutions. Multilateralism uh, will give way to unilateral actions. Uh, and uh, to bilateral agreements between interested parties. Uh, so we will uh, observe this atomization of global politics uh, with all the risks that uh, this uh, process uh, entails. Uh, so these are the three scenarios uh, which uh, I tried to outline. I think that uh, uh, definitely uh, it's up to you to decide uh, what scenario is more plausible uh, what scenario is more feasible. Uh, I think that uh, uh, in the end of the day, uh, the reformation scenario seems uh, to be uh, the uh, most attractive because when we're talking about uh, restoration, uh, as a historian, uh, I can observe that restoration has never been complete and uh, has never uh, been permanent. A restoration has always been a temporary stage in the international system, uh, so we cannot rely on as, as a stable uh, and uh, lasting arrangement uh, for uh, the global politics. Uh, as far as revolution is concerned, uh, I think that it contains uh, too many risks, uh, including the risks of uh, major military conflicts 
and uh, risks uh, of uh, even a global military, maybe nuclear confrontation. Uh, again, it's not an answer because uh, after the world order is completely uh, uh, disintegrated, after the international stability is destroyed, uh, someone will have to address the issue of how to restore international stability and uh, how to rebuild the world order. So in my opinion, uh, the uh, reformation scenario is uh, uh, the optimum development. Uh, however, it is not ideal because it entails many compromises, uh, including compromises on principles, uh, compromises on the outcomes of the current crisis, and uh, compromises uh, uh, between uh, liberal democracies uh, and uh, illiberal autocracies. Uh, definitely uh, criticized by many in the West, but also in the East. But I think in the end of the day, uh, this is the way to go. And finally, let me just uh, conclude uh, my presentation with saying that uh, when I'm looking back uh, uh, into the accomplishments uh, of uh, my generation of uh, scholars, uh, politicians, and public figures over the last 30 years, uh, I cannot but uh, feel quite disappointment uh, with our multiple failures. We didn't manage to use the opportunities that emerged in the end of the Cold War. Uh, we took uh, our mission uh, too lightly. Uh, we could not uh, prevent uh, the disaster that is uh, now unraveling just in front of our eyes. And uh, all of us, directly or indirectly, should take uh, some responsibility, some responsibility for what has happened uh, in Europe and outside of Europe and uh, what is happening in Europe uh, uh, now. So I do hope uh, that uh, the generation of uh, students uh, of those uh, who participate in this event uh, will demonstrate uh, more wisdom, uh, more strategic thinking, and uh, probably will have more luck uh, to turn out more successful uh, than my generation did. Uh, I wish you well. Thank you. I, I, I think, Andre, um, that we share a lot of uh, points of view, including the generational one. We also feel responsible over here as well. We had such high hopes, maybe too high hopes, in 89 and 90, and we didn't follow through on it on this, um, part of, in this part of the world either. I think there's also agreement on the fact of how detrimental to security this uh, contracted conflict um, impacts on all of us. And I want to thank you for laying out those three scenarios, although any combination of those three scenarios is also a possible scenario. Um, I want to try to open it up uh, to the audience here. Um, just for the speakers who weren't here this morning, we have about 50 students from about 30 different countries, um, all of them with some kind of expertise or background in these uh, general issues we've been discussing about security and uh, global institutions and, and coming from very different regions. So I'd like someone to maybe start us off, um, put your hand up, make comments, or, or question um, some of the panel speakers from this afternoon. Um, yes, uh, I think it's Joanna. Kosho? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. We'll see how they go. We may have to. So the, yeah, internet freezes here once in a while. I have, uh, go ahead, Joanna. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you all the panelists, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you all, uh, the professors and the researchers, for the presentation. They were very, very interesting. Um, I want to ask. I have many questions, really, but I want to ask only three, if I can. Uh, first of all, I condemn the war. The war is terrible. So um, this is not. Uh, uh, discussed. Uh, you, we cannot discuss the war. Uh, that is a very big uh, 
uh, threat and a very big problem. But I'm, I'm very curious to know from all the panelists and especially from Mr. Uh, Kortunov, um, we all have uh, international relations background. So we know about the balance of powers. And I'm curious, uh, is a weak Russia a bigger problem for the balance of powers in the global chess play than a powerful Russia? This is the first, the first question that I have. Uh, can I go on with all the questions and then um, wait for the answers? Can I? Okay. We'll collect a few. Uh, I go on? Yeah. Okay, the second one, the second one is um, beside the NATO threat that Russia claims, uh, what do you know about the 46 biolabs founded by US in Ukraine? I'm a journalist, I'm a professor, I read a lot, so I, I read about this and I was curious to, to discuss about this. Uh, and the third question, why the Russia-Ukraine war happened during the Biden administration and not in the Trump era? <laughs> okay. So All these right. are my Okay, okay. thank you. Um, Andre, I think we'll um, direct some of these to you first of all, um, especially the question about a weaker or a stronger Russia, and, and maybe the question about why the war happened now. Thank you. Uh, you know, I don't want Russia to be excessively weak, but the question is how we define uh, the power of a country. I always believed that one of the problems uh, for Russia was that uh, it uh, has always had very limited number of uh, instruments that it could use in its uh, foreign policy. Uh, Russia is a nuclear power. Uh, can, one can even say that it is a nuclear uh, superpower, uh, which allows uh, Moscow to play a special role in the international system. Russia has uh, power projection capabilities, which it demonstrated in Syria or in, uh, in Kazakhstan recently. Uh, it uh, is, or at least it has been, an important uh, source of uh, uh, commodities like uh, oil and gas uh, and uh, uh, food uh, and some other commodities. And uh, it has a special place uh, in the international system as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, uh, as one of the founding members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or, BRIC, or BRICS. Is it enough uh, to claim power in the international relations of the 21st century? My personal uh, uh, point is that uh, it is not enough. It is not enough. Uh, Russia has to diversify uh, its uh, foreign policy toolkit uh, if it wants uh, to remain uh, an important player uh, in the international politics. Uh, but uh, I also believe in the balance of powers. I do believe that uh, with all the reservations we can have about uh, multipolarity, it is still uh, uh, probably the most natural state of international relations. Uh, and I can only hope that uh, uh, in some time from now, maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, in your lifetime, uh, we will see what I would call mature multipolarity uh, with uh, a couple of uh, centers of power interacting around each other. Uh, on the Biden administration, uh, let me say that, of course, we can only speculate uh, why Putin made the decision uh, to start the military operation only uh, uh, under Biden, not under Donald Trump. Uh, one of the uh, speculations, and uh, I don't know to what extent uh, these speculations are valid, but uh, uh, one uh, of the speculations is uh, that uh, uh, the Russian leadership uh, observed uh, the U.S. Uh, performance, or rather the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in, uh, in the end of uh, summer and early fall uh, of last year 
uh, and uh, the conclusion that was made uh, was made on the basis of uh, this uh, uh, analysis was that uh, Biden is a weak president, uh, that uh, Biden uh, couldn't unite the United States uh, uh, around his administration, and uh, uh, Biden is not in a position to take a strong uh, stance uh, on uh, a potential conflict uh, between uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this is, as I said, this is a speculation. Uh, definitely, we cannot prove it right now. Uh, but uh, when uh, Trump uh, says that, uh, you know, uh, such, su su such a conflict couldn't have happened uh, uh, when uh, he used to be the U.S. president, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, we can argue that uh, uh, some context uh, between the United States and the Russian Federation uh, that uh, uh, helped to maintain a degree of stability or were clearly broken uh, under the Biden administration and that probably contributed to the escalation. Thank you.